Hi, I'm Jonathan O'Toole, and I've been completely banned from Facebook. I can't even access my account. Can't create a new account unless I get a new phone number here in the U.S. I do have an African account, but I can't access that one because I can't go to Africa because of coronavirus. But I want to talk about Elizabeth Johnston, a.k.a. Activist Mommy. She, even though I'm not on Facebook, I can look at her public Facebook post today about her husband, Dr. Patrick Johnston, where she accuses him of adultery. Starting 16 years ago, she says he committed, quote-unquote, adultery and gave her cause, she biblical. says, for biblical cause for divorce. Um, you know, referring to Jesus' statement that, that, that except for the cause of uncleanness or fornication. Um, so I want to talk about this because, incidentally, I was around Dr. Johnson about the same time, 16 years ago. I have no idea, no witness, I'm no witness to any of uh, her accusations, but I was around Elizabeth briefly, and uh, now known as Activist Mommy, and Dr. Johnston, and it was also about 16 years ago, I remember, because ACOG conference, the American College of OBGYNs, which we were protesting because they're radically pro-abortion, was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 16 years ago, in 2004, 2004. And so that, that nails it down in my memory. So about 16 years ago, when activist mommy accuses her husband of first committing what she calls adultery, um, I was around Dr. Johnson. I was friends with him. Didn't know him real well, but I was hanging out with him as a liaison for survivors of the abortion holocaust as we were going around the country protesting abortion. And at that time, he was the leader and his wife was the kind of like the backup. She was in the normal role of a, of a wife. And he was uh, donating money to survivors, which is run by Jeff White in California. Uh, even though this really has nothing to do with Jeff White, but it's survivors of the abortion holocaust. And I was, a, I was the liaison and he was helping us out. Uh, buying our hotel rooms, and he was very, very helpful and generous. And at one point, I'm not sure if it was before or after ACOG in 2004, 16 years ago now, I was 24 years old, I'm 40 now, he brought me to his house, and I'd never met Elizabeth Johnston, I didn't have any um, baggage, I didn't have any, um, the only thing that people knew about me at that time was that I had been um, someone who had publicly stood up for Paul Hill, James Kopp and the other prisoners of Christ who had physically interposed with um, bombs or guns or in any way firebombing clinics to stop babies from being murdered by abortion. Prison, what we call now prisoners of Christ. People who to this day, many of whom are still in prison. Paul Hill was executed the year before in 2003. But people who took a stand and actually defended the preborn. And I, but I wasn't talking about that. Uh, Dr. Johnson just brought me into their house, and Elizabeth Johnson, a, Johnston, a.k.a. Activist Mommy, saw me in the foyer. Instead of welcoming, welcoming me, showing me hospitality, being friendly, and I wasn't there to talk about any disagreements, had no idea of, about any disagreements, Doctor, I, but I knew Dr. Johnston had taken a public stand to say that preborn deserved the same defense as the, as the born, like I say publicly all the time now, uh, and he had taken a public stand, and he was cool with me on that, and he had taken a righteous stand on that as a physician and as a doctor. And so Dr. Johnston brought me into his house, and uh, this is 16 years ago, during around the time where she accuses him of committing adultery. That's her word. And she looked, took, one, took one look at me and then took Dr. Johnston, Dr. Patrick Johnston, off to the side and said, come here, let's talk. Left me in the front room. And, I, and she didn't even try to hide what she was saying. She said, I thought, because to her, I represented the people who had bombed abortion clinics, even though I've never attacked any abortionist, I've never killed any abortionist. I simply said they were heroes because they treated the preborn as though they were equal of worthy defense. And her husband was well known at that time for saying the same thing. The preborn deserve the same defense as the born. Well, she pulled him aside. And she basically told him, now I'm paraphrasing, I cannot remember word for word what happened 16 years ago. But she very clearly told him, this guy represents Army of God, he represents uh, these defensive action people, and I thought you and I had agreed that we were moving away from that, that it was not the political, I got the impression that she was saying that the political trajectory that I have, uh, that we have decided upon for our futures as uh, activists does not involve us hanging out with people like this. So there I was, 24 years old. He brought me into his house, utterly repudiated, 
you know, basically to my face by Elizabeth Johnston, who has gone on in the past 16 years to eclipse her husband, even calling him Mr. Mom in Facebook posts as she hangs out with Mike Pence, as she um, has become the, the face of the pro-life movement in many ways. And what does that amount to? Okay, first of all, a woman prancing around in, in her mascara, <laughs> um, uh, eclipsing her husband, calling him Mr. Mom, uh, has a Jezebel dominatrix flavor to it that is not just uh, something subtle that I'm picking up on, but, but actually characterizes the pro-life movement. Because the pro-life movement for many decades has been characterized by women who define resistance, words like war, words like resistance, in terms of literally everything except what war and resistance means, which is literally defending the preborn. And when anybody breathes the idea, like, like I did at 24 years old and before, that, that maybe the people who actually defended the preborn were heroes, that we should, that we should uh, advocate for the way Sinn Féin or the IRA would advocate for their uh, warriors, okay, and I'm not justifying the, them, but I'm just using that as an example, because ours are much more righteous, because these people like James Kopp and Paul Hill and Scott Roeder, who later shot George Tiller, after the events I'm talking about in 2004. But Scott Roeder is another one who shot George Tiller, the baby killer, in the head, okay? Who was killing thousands of, of late-term abortion babies. My point is that our heroes are way easier to justify than the ones of the abolitionists, like James, uh, um, uh, what's his name? The Jim, uh, what's his name, Rob? Um... John Brown. John Brown. I was trying to, I was conflating Jim Cop, who shot Barnett Sleppy and the abortionist, with John Brown, who <clears throat> chopped off the heads of slaveholders. Well, Nat Turner. Yeah, right, right. Nat Turner and his rebellion. These are, these are people who wet their swords with blood against the institution of slavery. You can make arguments on both sides. I'm not here to do that. My point is, one thing is crystal clear. If the preborn are people, they're not just being enslaved and having their basic human rights uh, taken away while they're allowed to live. They're being genocided. And so clearly, if, they're, if they are persons, they deserve to be defended. Our heroes, who are suffering, and who very few are ministering to, and who those few are, are rejected simply for ministering to them, or saying their names, our heroes are the most pristi morally pristine of all in the history of movements in modern history that I'm aware of. Uh, except Eric Rudolph has confessed to blowing up the Olympics, okay, and he says it was a mistake. Uh, so accepting that action of Eric Rudolph's, all of the things that they did are perfectly, some of them maybe not so wise, but perfectly morally justifiable. A child can see it, okay? A child can see it. And the fact that we have defined within the pro-life movement and even the neo-pseudo-faux-abolitionist um, movement has defined resistance as everything other than acknowledging that those people are heroes. And that the people who are leading it, well, what has Elizabeth Johnston been doing? What does activist mommy do? She just, she just latches on to the moment, the need that people have to feel outraged by whatever abomination is, is going on next. And they're abominable. She latches on to them. She talks about them. We all say we're, we feel bad about them. She goes, she meets with Pence. Um, what's happening? Trump and Pence are promoting sodomy worldwide. Okay, these people don't take us seriously. These goddamn politicians are not taking us seriously. Well, they don't. We don't deserve for them to take us yeah, seriously. Because we're not serious. Because the moment someone even speaks up and says, hey, maybe these people deserve to be defended, uh, the, the, the so-called uh, activist mommy uh, runs them out of their house. I, for one, am convinced that they are now government-controlled resistance, whether they understand that or not. So that's what I'm accusing Elizabeth Johnston of being, whether she understands it or not, government-controlled resistance. And more importantly, I'm telling you, Jezebel cannot cast out Jezebel. That's right, Jezebel, activist mommy. Jezebel cannot cast out Jezebel. You're calling your husband Mr. Mom. Of course his libido gets uh, directed in another direction. Now, if he committed adultery, there's an authority. For the word adultery, if you're referring to the Bible and to Jesus and to the Old Testament, okay, or even the New Testament, there's a, there's a very specific word in Greek and Hebrew for adultery. It's distinct from the word for fornication. 
and it's even distinct from for the words for whoremongering, okay? Or pornos, or what? Concubine. Or concubines, or a concubine, or a concubine. It's a distinct concept. Um, it doesn't justify uh, whoremongering. People will go to hell for being whoremongers who don't repent. People will go to hell for, uh, for, um, uh, for committing uh, fornication, okay? Uh, so I'm not justifying those things, but there is a distinct concept in the Bible, Old and New Testament, called adultery. And if you look it up in Strong's Concordance, it very clearly says, and has said for many years, because those people are forced to define the words. They're not defining the consensus of what Christian men or Christian women have decided they feel like is their, is their moral spectrum for, for defining words. They've got to deal with the text, okay? And that's what Strong's Concordance is. It's the even Catholics, Protestants of all flavors have agreed that Strong's Concordance essentially defines the words in the Hebrew. Okay? And I'm not a Hebrew expert. I don't know Hebrew at all. But I know how to use the Strong's Concordance. And it's very clear. It's not something people talk about very much. But it's very clear. It says in the Strong's Concordance, in so many words, always with the wife of another. Okay? Adultery is always with the wife of another. Now, you cannot, Elizabeth Johnston, <laughs> out of two sides of, of your forked mouth, all right, of your forked tongue, Jezebel, uh, put a public accusation about your husband that he committed adultery 16 years ago and then tell us to respect your privacy. I'm not even on Facebook and I can access it. I know he's a good man. I disagreed with him and I wrote an article in opposition to him openly and he got angry with me years ago, and we haven't talked in years. I've tried to reconcile with him, but I know, in his heart of hearts, Dr. Johnston is a good man. If he committed adultery, it's very sad. I hope he repents. But if you're accusing him, as you have, of committing adultery, there's no privacy anymore. You've made a public accusation. Okay, woman? You've made a public accusation, and you can't make a public accusation against a man and then turn around and say, respect our privacy. There is no more privacy. You better tell us whose wife he took 16 years ago or subsequently. Are you hearing me? Because adultery has a meaning. You've used the word. I don't care who counseled you and told you it's okay. Strong's concordance is there. It's real. It, it has a meaning. Moses had a meaning when he said it. Jesus had a meaning when he said it. And if your husband committed it, by gum, you better tell us with whose wife it was. Jezebel. Now, if it was a concubine, then she's slandering him. If it was a concubine, meaning if he's taken uh, a harlot or a virgin woman and made her his uh, concubine... Do I justify that? Am I saying that I would advise him to do that? No. Um, but if she was not someone else's wife, then you are slandering him when you use the word adultery. Because in reality, even though he's married to pretty little you, um, and even though you might hate it, <laughs> the reality is that him taking a concubine, or even committing the sin of fornication, or even committing the sin of being a whoremonger, if he did those, okay, is, um, is not adultery. It's not adultery. It's not adultery. And, it's uh, fornication it, or concubinage. It's fornication or concubinage. Yeah, That's, right. It's what it is. It's what the Bible says it is. You know? And it is not adultery, as Strong's clearly says, always with the wife of another man. Well, now, another thing is... The other thing, you're accusing him also of the pornography. Of course, we know that that doesn't justify the divorce, so it's sort of uh, immaterial to the divorce, right? Because at best, uh, if, he's, if he's fantasizing about... Uh, uh, unmarried women, he's fantasizing about fornication or whoremongering. And if he's fantasizing about uh, married women, he's fantasizing about adultery, which is bad, really bad, but not actually committing it. So neither one have anything to do with your uh, divorce problems. But guess what? We got problems in this country. Because we got we plenty of problems. We because we legalized pornography, and that isn't fixed any more than abortion is by whining about it. Every day, a new thing to whine about. It's fixed by organizing to take men to the places where they make the pornography and the people who make the pornography, the people who act in it, and the people who hold the cameras, and arresting them and putting them in jail and prosecuting them. Okay? And making it, and I know it's possible, even in the uh, Internet age, because now, uh, right now in Uganda, they've made it really hard. They've got a commission. They've got a ministry in Uganda that's dedicated to making it hard for Ugandans to access 
uh, pornography. And on the you, web. Yeah, on the web. And you can feel it in Uganda. You can feel the difference in the, in the level of, of shock that people have. You know, because there's something fundamental that you're never going to get. It's just like with abortion. You're never going to get, uh, like, like uh, Dr. Alveda King and, and uh, the Down syndrome man who testified in front of Congress said, uh, my goal is not to make abortion illegal. But to make it unthinkable. Boy, now that's a that's a slogan from or uh from hell. government yeah. government controlled yeah. resistance. Yeah. yeah, because that's yeah. a nice thing for school moms and nursery school, okay, to make evil things unthinkable. But in reality, abortion has always been thinkable, okay? It's always been thinkable. It has to be prosecuted. And, uh, and also pornography. Pornography is imminently thinkable because you ain't killing nobody, okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe in, in terms of the industry is killing people. That industry is definitely killing people, you know. But it's real easy to see that the act of masturbating to pornography is not the same as chopping somebody's head off. So that one's that much more easy to think about, right? And so that's why it's worked throughout throughout most of Christian uh, history to make the, to drive the pornographers. There was an episode of Dragnet where where, where they're going after the pornographers. So this is an ancient history we're talking about. We're talking about a few decades ago, Sergeant Friday. A few decades ago, pop culture, even post-Hollywood America, was still prosecuting, even in California, was still making a, a point of prosecuting pornography. Okay, so it, it needs to be done. Men are going to look at pornography as long as it's legal. Now, individual men can get out of it, but, but the fact is you're never going to get uh, um, even 51% of individual men to be strong enough to not look at pornography if it's at their fingertips. It's unrealistic, and it winds up being a sadistic, uh, uh, like, a sad like a dominatrix thing that every suddenly every female pastor, every pastor's wife, every Christian man's wife has now uh, relying almost on legalized pornography as the weapon that she can use once she finds out her husband has looked at it, now to control him for the foreseeable future. Probably Elizabeth Johnston was already controlling her husband in similar ways to that when uh, he, he was forced to uh, embarrassedly admit to me that he could not bring me into his house because his wife didn't want people who had defended Paul Hill and the defenders of the preborn to even enter her house, because she was afraid, she gave the reason why, she's afraid of the political implications that somebody entered her house who said the preborn were worthy of the same defense. And the this, preborn. this from a woman who was not afraid a couple of years ago to put up uh, uh, a Facebook video uh, giving her personal testimony, person. saying, where she was saying, you know, people think I'm some kind of angel and it's not true. You know, in days of yore, I was into bondage and domination. It wasn't up very long. She deleted the post. I've never been her friend. Yeah. Robert Rudnick is behind this, my phone camera, and he's he's recording this interview. And and he was friends with her on Facebook or subscribed to her. And and she and he's the one who who witnessed um, who witnessed that that her witness. Yeah. Yeah. And it came down pretty quick, as far as I know. Yeah, and, he, and she took it down. I, I think, you know, you're still a dominatrix. You think you're out of it, you're still a dominatrix. I'm accusing you, Elizabeth Johnson, that you're still a dominatrix. You're lording it over your husband. And I don't, uh, even though, even if it, if it involves sin, he needs to repent of it. But I don't blame him ultimately for finding, it's not, let me say it's not surprising to me that he would find another outlet for his libido when the authorized outlet for his libido is someone who can literally kick people out of his house whom he brought uh, through his doorway in peace and who wasn't arguing with you about any. I never even met you. I didn't come there to argue with anybody. I came in peace, 24 years old, and because I defended Paul Hill and James Cobb, I had to be kicked out of the house and he had to obey. Of course he's going to find somewhere else to, to put his seed. I hope it wasn't with a married woman, but you better put up or shut up and tell me if he took somebody else's wife, um, you've already publicly accused him of it, whose wife did he take? 